Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Faris Energy PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during today's meeting. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and will publish those responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll and your participation, I'm sure, will be well received by the company. And I'd now like to hand over to CEO Jan Brown. Good afternoon, Jan. Good afternoon and thanks everybody for your interest and for joining us today. Uh, with me presenting are Sue Rivett, our CFO, and Mohamed Syed, our Group Head of Technical. We're going to go through the presentation at a bit of a pace because we've already got quite a few questions in uh, and encourage you to submit any uh, during the, the presentation itself so that at the end we've got time to focus on the bits that, that really interest you. Okay, can we move to the first slide please, Manan? So when we were here in March, we talked about resetting the dial and we've come a long way since then. Uh, we've got production guidance that we're well on track to meet. Supported by that and the oil price, we've had very strong cash generation uh, in the first half of the year and continuing. And that's given us choices. We've been able to invest into our assets, but also uh, we've initiated a share buyback program in July, which is ongoing. And last week we announced the framework for the resumption of regular dividends which will start in 2023. We've also announced our commitment to net zero and both the dividends and net zero will come back to at the end of this slide deck. Now Mo will go into the detail on the asset side with just a very uh, brief high level overview. Vietnam, uh, we're drilling um, starting this month. The objectives of the drilling programme are really about maintaining production levels. But when you've got payback periods on drilling of about six to seven months on TGT and net backs for the Vietnam production uh, of over $50 a barrel uh, at $100 oil, this is production well worth maintaining. We're also in the process of requesting license extensions to take the licenses through to the early 2030s. Also in Vietnam, we've got Block 125, which is an exciting basin opening play, um, the largest undrilled or virtually undrilled basin left in Southeast Asia. Um, seismic substantially complete. There were some delays, um, largely COVID related on processing the seismic, but it's nearly complete. The well planning is ongoing and there are a number of parties that have already uh, indicated interest in farming in. So that's Vietnam. In Egypt, we announced in July that we had secured a rig on long-term contract. Anyone who follows the industry in Egypt knows that this is a very hot market for rigs. That gives us the foundation to uh, drill uh, El Fayum and help get those production levels up. And even more importantly, what Mo will talk to you about is further value enhancements that he has under review with IPR. We're also going to drill the first well on our exploration block, NBS, in Q4. And just as a reminder, we are fully carried for all joint venture costs, um, OPEX, CAPEX and g &A. And with that, I'll hand you over to Sue to talk you through the numbers. Thanks, Jan. Um, yeah, if I could take you through the first half uh, results, I guess we should start with the production number. Uh, so just under 8,000 barrels of oil uh, per day there. Um, we, sh we should put that on a like-for-like -like basis because during the period uh, we farmed down from 100% to 45% on our Egyptian uh, producing assets. And so on a like-for-like -like basis, that comes up to just over 9,000 barrels a day. So pretty flat. Um, period on period with the same period last year. Uh, I should mention uh, the Vietnam production 8% up, uh, which is important. Um, as you would expect, the revenues have increased considerably this year, so 130 million um, essentially up because of that oil price, uh, $65 in uh, first half uh, 21 
versus just under 110 for this period. So a great result there in terms of the oil prices. Um, from a cash generation perspective, up uh, over 200% to 57 million. Uh, so great cash generation from our operations there. In terms of the balance sheet, uh, we've seen a strengthening of the balance sheet up to 353 million there. That's uh, largely the result of um, being able to take bring back uh, impairments that we'd written in previous periods. So a reversal of that, largely due to the oil price, but also due to uh, an improvement in the fiscal terms in Egypt uh, with that cost recovery uh, improvement from 30% to 40%, which gives us an extra 20% on our revenues. Um, and if I could move to the cash flows, Minan, that would be great. Thank you. So in terms of the, the cash flows, we, we end the, the half year at 47.5 million, so up 20 million in the period. Um, I'll just concentrate on a couple of numbers there. So 10.1 uh, consideration received, that's from IPR, our new partners in Egypt. Uh, 3 million of that is cash consideration and 7.1 is part of the carry that we're starting to, to, to come into, you know, taking uh, from the deal itself. And I'll come back to the deal so, uh, later in the, in the slide decks. Um, in terms of other things to note, you see the 7.5 and the 6.7 and in and out, basically, that's the National Bank of Egypt facility that we have, which is very much a working capital uh, facility, allowing us to draw down and back. So a very uh, good facility to have in our toolkit, if you like. And then if I could move to the net debt. Uh, so concentrating on uh, the four columns there, you'll see operating cash flow 27.6. That number is important as we move forward and Jan will talk about that as part of the dividend um, position that we've announced to, uh, today. Uh, so 76 million coming in there from operations. Uh, unfortunately, taxes, we all have to pay our taxes, so 27 million going out there to, to the government for those. Uh, also important that I draw your attention to the 18.9, which is an adverse movement on the working capital uh, position. Um, of note is uh, the Egyptian receivables, which is 14.9 uh, at the end of the period. That was uh, seven point five at uh, December. That increase is largely a factor of a catch-up invoice that we were able to put into EGPC for that improvement in the fiscal terms. So, so you know, partly to do with that, but also we'll also pick up the fact that in country there is a limited uh, US dollar uh, position and, and therefore that was is impacting uh, the receivable position as well. But I'll pick up on that later on as we move through. Uh, in terms of the next slide, please, uh, Minan, so on hedging, uh, we've put a bit more colour in the hedging here that, that you've asked for previously. So we've, we've put the swaps separately against the zero, they're all zero cost colours, I should say, there, but that gives you the volumes that we've traded and the prices that have been achieved on those uh, products during the, those periods. What we should say is that the hedged production is moving uh, from fairly heavily hedged um, a few months back to a lot lower position as we move forward. The first half was 40-45% that was hedged uh, effectively to protect uh, the balance sheet. Uh, as you know, 35% uh, of the um, volumes, the Vietnam volumes have to be hedged for the, um, the RBL. Uh, so just to confirm on that. If we move forward to the Egypt position, please, Manan, thank you. Uh, so in terms of Egypt, um, you'll have seen the fiscal terms uh, before in our results. That's that 7 million that I mentioned, a catch up invoice uh, for past uh, sales, which was good to be able to um, send that into EGPC. In terms of the deal, so small cash consideration, 5 million, by, by far the biggest chunk the 37 million is the carry uh, that Jan mentioned and that was 
essentially the money to kickstart again the development program there during the period we've uh, utilized 7.1 million of the carry um, and we expect to utilize a further just under 14 million in the second half uh, with 16 million being carried into 2023 so you know a great position there we carried not only for um, capex but opex and gna um, also of note is the contingent consideration so anything above brent price of uh, 62 up to a cap of 90.5 and we'll achieve a 5 million over the next four years uh, so we should expect to see uh, 5 million into our bank account first of june next year uh, in us dollars so that would be the first of the four year period so and then if i could move to the next slide please Minan. thank you uh, so in terms of the cash capex for forecast for the full year uh, we would have been we would be spending around 44 million however we have funded uh, on that carry uh, for 15 million of that so down to 29 million that we're funding from our pockets if you like um, and in terms of um, 2022 23 key considerations revenue still being received direct uh, into our to our account we should uh, obviously address the receivables um, position there the uh, lack of liquidity of us dollars in country um, and you know we are working on that very hard i'd say you know we've got about six projects going uh, to improve the dials there to make sure that we can get us dollars uh, converted rather than accept uh, egyptian pounds which is um, it, you know it it's uh, in difficulty at uh, this point in time um so in terms of uh, Vietnam, so some low break evens, uh, fast payback, as, as Jan mentioned, so six to seven months on the TGT wells, the two wells we've got there. Uh, the CMV well takes a little bit longer, much more stable production, uh, lower stable production, so around 24 months. Um, but the great thing is we're back to uh, dividends and uh, share buybacks as we move forward. Um, so thanks very much with that. And I'll hand over to Mo to update you on the technical side. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of things before we get in the slides. Number one, you've heard the highlights from Jan, which shows the strong performance in the first half of the year. So I will not go through all the details of what she's already uh, communicated. I will not also be reading every word on the slide. I will hit the main point. I will give you a little bit of details. Because of the time, I cannot give you the full details. However, I would like this to be more interactive, so the time on the q and I will be more than happy to answer any of the questions you may have. And some of the questions that have already been submitted will, uh, will address some questions. Okay, just jumping right into it, uh, as you can see in the plots in the middle, it shows a steady, strong performance in, uh, in Vietnam, in TGT in the top plot, and CNV in the bottom plot which uh, still underpin our, uh, our confidence that we're going to deliver the guidance. It's same we delivered the guidance last year and the year before, and this year we're confident we'll meet the guidance in Vietnam. The performance in TGT is underpinned by the four wells we've drilled in 2021, which you can see them on the map on the right highlighted in yellow. So you can see on the map four wells highlighted in yellow. In yellow, these are the four wells we drilled in 2021. The two wells we plan to drill in 2020, it two are highlighted in orange, and you can see they're uh, planned to be in different fault blocks. The first of the two back-to-back -back wells in TGT is already started, and we're like three, four days into drilling. Uh, on the map also is referenced nine contingent wells without specific location on this map. The significance of those contingent wells is because uh, there is a pathway to monetize 2C to 2P, and I will pick up on this in the next slide. Okay, so next slide, please. Starting from the left side with TGT and staying with the operations theme, the operation team in Vietnam did a really good job fixing the compressor issue that happened late last year. Early in the quarter, uh, in Q1, so this way contributed uh, to production and helped 
under ban that steady strong performance in TGT. Away from the operations, the subsurface team have been working on updating the full field development plan for the contract extension. NTGT contract extension to 2031 gives us an additional two years with roughly 1.3 million barrel of oil equivalent net reserves to forest just because of the timing. Um, the nine wells I've mentioned in the previous slides will be on top of those resources that were already progressed due to timing. The same thing on CNV, the team is working on mods update to the full, full field development plan and the contract extension to 2032, which is additional two years and uh, circa 0.7 million barrel of oil equivalent, moving from 2C to 2P uh, just because of those two extra year of timing. Okay, next slide. So this is one of the interesting uh, slides you may have some questions about but it's a good place to be in, an exciting, interesting place in a relatively underexplored basin, one of the last remaining in Southeast Asia. If I bring your attention to the map on the right, you can see the two blocks, 125 and 126, in gray, the 2D line that have been shot in seismic lines, highlighted in red are the 3D survey. The interesting thing about uh, the 3D survey and the, the 2D, we've already been able to map uh, several uh, different leads, as you can see them on this map. The different colors for the leads you're looking at are talking about different prospective reservoir horizons. So we have multiple different potential uh, prospective reservoir horizons, which is uh, good. The second good feature you can see are the size of those identified leads are pretty significant and also some of the, the shape also shows you different types of traps in the exploration concession and that's exactly the type of things that you want to see in uh, in, an, uh, in an exploration block so it, there is a myriad of different options to go after so the team in Vietnam right now is working on maturing the leads to prospects and taking the prospect to the real well uh, next year so that's one of the key focus Jen mentioned uh, that has been a little bit delayed because we're doing uh, the PSTM, the seismic uh, interpretation and the seismic processing, uh, and, and basically trying to improve on the quality of it. So that's been delayed uh, because of COVID, but we're, really, we're still on track. We still believe we can, we're progressing things. First time uh, we presented publicly was in June, uh, our exploration manager in Vietnam presented about 125, 126 block in Asia PAC conference, and that created a lot of attention. So we've been seeing some encouraging interest from a potential farming East partners. Any of them uh, would be uh, a, a partner that we're happy with. Uh, so the focus so far, progress leads to prospects to drilling, uh, prepare to uh, and engage with those interested parties for a formal process. So those are the key two focus. I, I can't say too much about this right now, uh, because the work is still ongoing, but it's a good place to be in, uh, having something that uh, potentially significant. Going on to the last slide on Vietnam, the important part about this, as Jan mentioned, what I'd like to share with you here is, yes, we 100% focus on the developed resource base, that's including the drilling that we're currently doing in TGT, the field optimization or intervention, the contract extension. It's significant, it's important, it generates, it generates the cash flow. And those are the green uh, highlighted bars at the bottom, which shows you we produce significant amount of oil. There is more uh, oil in the fire, is significant into P, and the pathway to move to P to 2C uh, to money in the bank. And that money can be reinvested in the asset or can be handed over as dividend and, buy, uh, and share buyback. The areas where we can uh, invest in the asset or we have this organic growth opportunity is, is pretty unique because in Vietnam, we have what we call uh, ILX or literally whichever of the terms you're familiar with. What it means really is infrastructure led exploration. So we're exploring in the development lease in the area where we have in our concession that's close to facilities. The advantage of this type of exploration is that you find something, you can drill it, tighten at a very small development cost and get it on production quickly, backfill that spare capacity 
that's already available. With the contract extension, there will be more of those opportunities to go after. Lastly, uh, also opening up this whole new production center with the exploration block in uh, 125, 126, which we've discussed in the previous slide. So that sums up the value, development, near term, midterm of ILX, and then uh, the, the basically the big frontier exploration, 125, 126. That concludes the Vietnam section, and I'm ready to move uh, to Egypt. So in Egypt, uh, you see uh, production increased in the first quarter with the modest amount of ramp up and activities we've done. You see that in the top plot, which shows you the increase in production with three wells being put on production until end of June. Uh, the interesting thing about Egypt, and you just need to remember um, that we, the bottom plot, which shows you the history of the production of El Fayum since we took over as far as. So the deal closed in April, of 2019 and the second peak on production uh, in the solid green is basically when we were able to build the momentum ramp up activity it took us about roughly a year to build up momentum and ramp up activity we had one drilling rig we brought the second and we were working on that and we were increasing production every month as you can see in the last three months of before we had to shut down for covid we were adding two three hundred barrel uh, every month it just because of the ramp up activity gain momentum. Unfortunately for us, it happened at the worst time possible, which seemed to be a feature in the fame, but happened during COVID and the oil price crashed. Had then the oil price crashed, we, were, we would have been able to finish 2020 at a high number, okay, and then continue 2023 from a higher number with the same activity level to deliver El Fayum full field development plan. So in summary, what's important here, yes, it, it takes a little bit of time in El Fayum to build the momentum, but once you build that momentum, you see the impact on production. And for us as far as, if it wasn't for COVID, we would have been continued. You see, look at the production and how the slope of increases. When COVID happened, we had to, head, uh, to halt all activities. So I went to Cairo and swiftly ran down uh, all the operations and for a period of 18 months. We pretty much hope all investment. Nobody knew how long it's going to take or the impact on the oil price. When we've seen the rebound in the oil price, we started back investment and we already were progressing a far more process. So around November, we went back to drilling with one drilling rig, one well uh, was drilled. IPR took over and since uh, so far in the period, uh, they were able to drill uh, six wells. I'll talk about them in the next slide. But what's good, so far is with the modest amount of activities we've done, as you see in the production plot at the bottom. Second call out in green is when IPR uh, deal closed, which is March 2022. You can see the production increased and stabilizing. So those are the signs that you want to see as you start this ramping up operation journey we're on. So it's all uh, been handled. Uh, IPR is going after it with our support and we're pushing hard. Menan, if I move to the next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanted to say on this slide, two things. Staying with El Fayum to just wrap it up, two things are important to say. We've put four wells on production till August. Two wells have just been put on production, and then two more are planned till end of this year. So that's the sum up of the drilling uh, for so far and the rest of the year. The important uh, to mention is the supply chain interruption which for us impacts the water flood uh, ramp up ability. We have a surface pumps required from a supplier that uh, basically we elected not to work with them. We are different vendors and different implement the ramp up in the water flood. So if anything, I would like to see, I would like to have seen a little bit more ramp up in the water flood than what we have already seen in the first half, but that's already uh, progressing, looking at different options. So a lesser extent interrupted by the supply chain is our ability to secure spare parts on relatively short order. But if they, they are really, really important, we pay for air freight and get it and keep the operation going. So that's some sort uh, El Fayum for you. And moving on to something similar to 125. It's an exploration block in Egypt, North Venice Swift. Similar in the sense it's exploration lower in magnitude, so it's not as big as we expect 125, 126 to be, 
But the advantage of that exploration block, it's a low cost, low risk exploration block. It's surrounded by already producing Apache's field, uh, fields. So we have uh, a well planned in the first, uh, in, in this year, the first commitment well in MDS, and that's basically across the lease boundary from an already existing Apache field. Uh, uh, with the MBS, we've already have inherited a uh, small seismic survey. On that seismic survey, we were able to identify several uh, good prospects, and we also plan to shoot small 3D seismic survey. So IPR submitted uh, to the government for an extension of the exploration period to allow time to drill those uh, exploration prospects. So depending on the timing and the prospect, we could be drilling the first commitment well, uh, in this year and then move the reg and come back later, or we delay drilling the commitment well to roughly first quarter and the first quarter next year and drill a couple of them back to back. But we're progressing MBS work. We think it's a value adding, it's a low risk, low cost exploration available for us in Egypt. My last slide in Egypt is the next one. And in the same way, I showed you the different value creation, value enhancement and opportunities for organic growth in forest in Vietnam, I'm showing with you the share. Uh, I'm sharing with you the same thing in Egypt. The bottom uh, chart shows you our uh, percent, the 45 percent. We produced 25 million already, 17 million 2P already been identified, and eight more from uh, 2C moves to 2P with additional drilling. So again, there is a pathway to produce to move 2C to 2P to production to money in the bank. That money, like I said, dividends or otherwise we can invest or both invest in the asset. The ILX exploration opportunities in Egypt are pretty significant. We have conventional and unconventional. The conventional part is split into two different components. One component is drill the same structure we have further away in the development lease. So those are uh, the shallow reservoirs we produced, where we produce from today. And then a deeper, more prolific reservoirs they are producing in the Western Desert elsewhere, but not yet in El Fayum. So drilling deeper around 12 to 14,000 feet for those deep, deeper reservoirs, which will have a, a potential big, a big potential on the El Fayum production. Lastly, uh, ARF is a significant unconventional resources that's been recognized by us and others. We've done studies on it with US experts. It's an equivalent analogous of the Eagle for Chill. So it's an important resource, the in place in, uh, above 1 billion barrel in place. So at 3% recovery is still significant. And whether we do it ourselves or somebody does it for us is something that we continue to evaluate and pursue. And lastly, NBS, which is again opening up a whole new production center from an exploration block that we've discussed in the previous slide. So I won't go through it in more detail. That's pretty much wrap up my uh, Vietnam Egypt section operation and the different value enhancement, and I give it back uh, to Jan. Great, thank you. So a couple of slides on ESG, one in the dividend, and then one slide to wrap up, and I will move to Q and A. This is the usual metrics that you would expect from um, any EMP company. Um, you know, it takes their position seriously and, and tries to produce responsibly. Uh, the metrics are there transparently for all to see. The next slide is a bit of a departure for us. We have announced a commitment to net zero on our scope one and two emissions by 2050. Now 2050 is a sort of entry level date for making this commitment. Uh, so we will do what we can to try to accelerate that. And to support those efforts, we've announced the establishment of an emissions management fund. So for every barrel of oil sold where the oil price is above $75, we will put 25 cents aside into this fund and that will provide the capital to support whatever initiatives we identify to further reduce emissions. My sense is that in the early years, this is likely to be on operational efficiencies and improvements, but you never know technology and technological change moves quite quickly. And as part of this commitment, we'll produce a more detailed roadmap sometime in 2023. Okay, next slide, please. 
So shareholder returns, um, we've had the confidence with the cash flow generation to resume returns, first with the buyback started in July. Uh, we've used about half of that, just over half. And we've also announced the expectation of returning to regular dividends with a clear policy. Distributions will be based on operating cash flow, and that metric's been chosen because it takes into account oil price, tax, which is the main government take in Vietnam, unlike Egypt, where it's a production share of uh, the revenue line. And it also takes into account working capital movements. The minimum distribution uh, is going to be 10% of our operating cash flow. And we expect to declare the final dividend for 2022, um, based on the 2022 operating cash flow, uh, approve that by shareholders at the 2023 AGM and make the, the full payment after that. From 2023 onwards, we'll move to a payment in two instalments, an interim and a final. Happy to take questions on that later if there are any. So in conclusion, you've heard from Sue uh, about the cash flow engine that is working well. You've heard from Mo about the wide range of organic growth opportunities we've got in the pipeline. We've got developments in both Vietnam and Egypt. Egypt fully carried this year and into next. And of course, the enhanced license terms uh, which have added about 10 million to the top line um, on our share so far. And then in Egypt and in Vietnam, we've got exploration, though very different types of plays. So lots of growth to offer, organic growth already in the portfolio, and back to a focus on shareholders and cash returns with both the share buyback and regular dividends. So we're targeting both the yield and the growth sides and the growth side, we believe we can do organically from our portfolio for at least the next year to 18 months. And with that, we will finish the formal presentation and we'll move over to Q&A. That's great, Jan um, and Sue and Mohammed. Thank you very much for updating investors this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. But just while the team take a few moments to review your questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, will be accessible via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, Thank you to everybody for their questions this afternoon, and thank you to those that pre-submitted uh, their question in advance. And if I may, I'd just like to hand back to Georgia, who will moderate the Q&A. Uh, if I could ask you please to read out the questions, and um, obviously I'll pick up from you at the end. Thanks, Mark. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I will now run through the pre-submitted questions we have received over the last few days before turning to the live Q&A. Uh, we received a number of similar questions, which we have grouped together for ease. So turning to the first question on strategy, are you pursuing an M&A strategy? Would you consider merging with a similar size or larger pair to provide economies of scale? And I'll hand that over to Jan. Okay, thanks for that. So look, in 2020, we had to put our balance sheet into intensive care and we've worked really hard to get that back into shape whilst at the same time preserving as much of the value, the organic growth potential in the portfolio uh, as we possibly could. So we're now at a position where, as I said, the production levels are solid, the cash flow generation engine is working, and that's given us confidence to fix the yield side of the equity story, the um, buybacks, and now the clear dividend policy. On the growth side, um, retaining as much opportunity as we could, that's going to keep us occupied, as I said, for the next 12 to 18 months. And in doing that, it could be to look to prove up asset values and monetize and, and move on. Uh, and that's part of the tried and tested route for both this company and us as a management team. And then if you come to specific question about where does m and fit into um, all of those strategic elements, we don't rule it out, um, but we are focused on growth in value, not growth in scale. And if you take the economies of scale points, that would be, in our situation, almost exclusively uh, G&A 
uh, allocation over a broader asset base. And GNA, in our case, let's face it, is just a cost of being listed, premium listed, and um, being a responsible operator and a good corporate citizen. And if we were looking at any deal, we would take, we would factor in um, those GNA reductions as part of the overall equation of whether the deal was a growth in value rather than ju just a growth in scale. So though we keep an eye on opportunities and we have run the slide rule over some, uh, we are not chasing deals uh, for their own sake or for scale's sake. And if you look at the last few years, you, you can burn a lot of time, effort and money uh, in pursuing deals. And if you look at the reduction in GNA that we've achieved over the past few years, part of that is by reducing the size of the organisation, the size of the board. But part of it is, is simply um, reducing the amount of time and cost that we're spending on M&A. So not ruling it out, but it's not something that we're pursuing or, or that we count as a core part of our strategic direction at this point in time. So what we do offer is a clear dividend policy, the option of continuing with the buybacks and organic growth from assets that we already have in our portfolio. Thanks, Jan. Uh, the second question is, where is future production and revenue growth going to come from? One for more, I think. Yeah, I think we, in, in my section, I covered uh, the organic growth part. So we think uh, development, as I said, we focused on that development, drilling, uh, water flood, uh, the completions in Egypt, drilling in EGT and CMV. So that's the first part, this, the, the current development resource space, including monetizing the 2C to 2P to money in the land. So that's one clear pathway. The second one is through investing on those opportunities I've mentioned in the near term, the ILX in Vietnam and Egypt, and uh, with the funding partner in Vietnam for the 125.26 block and the NDS. So we have different uh, different opportunities in our hands to invest money in, and that's where the money uh, and the cash flow in the future, the projection uh, is coming from. Thank you. How should we think about shareholder returns and where will they come from? Dividends, buyback or share price appreciation? So in the company, we can control uh, the cash returns that we make to our shareholders. We can't control the share price um, and it's not our style to focus on running the business purely for the share price. We focus on value in the business itself. So focused on making the right investments in our assets to generate value, particularly in uh, terms of near term cash flow. Um, but we can't guarantee that that converts into share price appreciation. So we can control the cash returns. We have the ongoing buyback with the option to continue that. Um, it'll probably take about six months before we're through that committed three million. And that's why we've announced the very clear framework for dividends from 2023 onwards. Georgia, can I can I um, divert slightly? Because there's quite an interesting um, left field question come in on the current one. Um, so just to address that before we go on to the rest of the pre-submitted. Um, the question is from Ash Kay. And it is, are Faris planning to head back to working full time from office? Um, and everybody who knows me knows that I'm quite passionate about this. So I, I do really want to answer this one. And the answer is, it, it's very much employee led. We trust our employees. Uh, we are clear with them what we want them to deliver and by when. And then with a few exceptions where everybody needs to be together or small teams need to be together, it's up to them how and when uh, they deliver that. Some of our employees uh, have elected to be back in an office full time and we do have a small office space for them. Some much prefer the flexibility of working from home. And to me, this is an opportunity. And I know the pandemic accelerated it, but it's not about the pandemic. It's about the technological revolution following on the industrial revolution and the agricultural revolution, each of which has changed working practices. And if we don't explore different ways of working, then I think we will have missed a real opportunity. 
So the answer is it's employee led. So at this stage, no, but you know, could could all change in six months' time. Sorry, Georgia, back to the questions. Thanks, Jan. Um, turning to the questions we received on Egypt, uh, the first one was, as of the 1st of July, Faros has used approximately 20% of the free carry provided by IPR, but production in Egypt is down. Can you explain why and remind us why you chose to partner with IPR? What do they bring? Okay, so um, my first degree was history, so forgive me if I go back uh, a couple of years once again. Talked about being in intensive care in 2020, we, we were. Uh, we needed to take a number of remedial steps and the farm down was one of them, a really important one because we needed capital to develop the asset, um, but we also wanted to retain uh, some of the value that was inherent in that asset. So we went through the process, um, well-run process, and IPR made us the best offer. Uh, it was not only the best offer on the table, it was good enough. Shareholders approved it uh, at the time. And IPR as a partner have proved to be uh, a company that listens and is not just squeezing us out because we happen to be non-operated. So if you come to the production, one of the biggest lessons, probably the biggest lessons that we learned about this asset when we bought it in 2019 is that after a period of low investment, it takes a long time to ramp up. Um, we acquired it in April 19, got control. It was April 2020, a year, before we got the production levels back up. And as Mo said earlier, you know, <laughs> if the oil price crash hadn't happened, who knows what trajectory that would have been on. It didn't, so there's no point in crying over that. Um, so that pattern of ramp up um, is what we're seeing right now. Do we wish that there were more rigs available to throw more at it? Yeah, of course we do. But again, there's no point in crying about it. You've just got to take what there is on the market and move on. And, you know, Mo has some great stories to tell about how proactive IPR has been uh, in securing the rig that we've got. Um, and, you know, there, there are a lot of other companies who would be delighted to have this rig. So... We talked in March about the supply chain constraints and you know they're they're absolutely there uh, in the rig market. Uh, we also factored that into the guidance that we gave to the market in May. We're on track to meet those um, and uh, to deliver what we said was possible um, given these market constraints. And getting right back to the question, what IPR brings is capital, broad experience in Egypt, and a partnership that is collaborative and willing to listen, particularly to Mo, who knows this asset better than anyone. And we really value that. Thank you. Sure. How will the company fund its 45% share of the Egypt venture after the remaining carry has been fully used up next summer? Okay, perhaps I can take that. Um, yeah, the, the great thing, obviously, as we move forward, although we're in a carry period, which is brilliant, as we move forward, uh, Egypt will actually fund itself. So there should be no issues there, um, particularly at these prices. Um, so. Thank you. Turning to Vietnam, last week, the company said that in Vietnam, further development drilling on both TGT and CNV is due to commence imminently with the rig on location and preparing to spud. When is the drilling of the two wells on TGT due to be completed? And what is the expected impact on the gross barrels of oil per day? I'll take that. Um, <clears throat> so the drilling started, so we're confirming, and we expect it to finish by mid November, that's the expected time frame. On average, without giving specific numbers, so it's between 25 to 3,000 barrel oil per day between the two wells. So roughly on average, I'd say 3,000, uh, but they come in at different time and you can see them uh, on the slide. So that's the answer to this particular question. But while I'm at it, there was another question in the ones that have been asked right now. Just need uh, the question was asked by Sam S. If Vietnam is such a high net back, why uh, we're not we're only drilling two to three wells? And and the reason really in nutshell is because the current contract extension, the current contract finishes uh, initially before last year it was finishing in 2024, 
last year we were granted two years extension which makes it finish in 2026 those uh, wells in vietnam they're high net back so continue that investment and the contract extension we're working on will enable that further drilling so that's it thank you uh, so the next question on vietnam could you share with us the late could you share with us the latest with regards to the license situation at the TGT field? Um, if a license extension to year 2031 is granted, can we expect more drilling in the future to support the production plateau? Okay, so uh, I'll continue the operations question. So first, let's answer them backwards. So the first part is we expect with the license extension additional drilling. Yes, that's one of the things I've mentioned in my slides. Uh, in the slide section, I'm just answering the previous question. The work ongoing right now for the contract extension to 2031 uh, is basically include that update to the full field development plan, which identify some, uh, identifying some of the future uh, well locations. So all of which will help support the production plan. Thank you. If the lease extension at TGT is granted till year 2031 is the design life of the leased FPSO sufficient to remain on the field till then as it has now been operating at the TGT field since 2011. Uh, our, the boat uh, owners, Bumi Armada, they tell us it is we, with uh, the subject to the proper uh, and satisfactory inspection. We think it does not require to go to uh, the dry docking, so we think it's continue subject to the proper uh, and satisfactory. Um, and the last one on Vietnam of the pre-submitted questions is, as the FPSO lease contract ends in 2024, is the company planning for shorter one-year optional extensions beyond that or a longer period, um, for example, seven years extension to see out the contract till 2031? Okay, uh, we will do the contract extension accordingly. Uh, I think the question mentioned 2024, which I corrected uh, our current contract expiry is 2026 in TGT because we were granted two years last year. So that's already uh, extending the contract. And um, yes, with the contract basically with Bring Your Model will extend for that period. I've answered in the previous one to 2031. They're telling us, yes, we will do the proper inspection and the certification to extend it to 2031 as the contract ex extends. Thanks. And moving over to some more general questions now. Um, Faros has great assets and one of the best management teams in the sector. Why is that not reflected in the share price? And Jan, I think you're on mute. It, I wish I knew. Uh, we've been doing the rounds with our current shareholders, as you would expect after the interims. The institutional shareholders are really happy with the combination of the buyback and the dividend policy and also the net zero commitment. That's really important to them. We've got uh, quite a portion of our register in uh, high net worth shareholders. They're very happy with the dividend being resumed. They've all said that they like the transparency and the fact that we're prepared to discuss risks as well as um, uh, uh, as well as uh, just the positive aspects. So the current shareholder base, um, uh, sorry, the institution's high net worth, um, very positive feedback from this set of results. Um, what is apparently really difficult is to attract um, new shareholders into the story. So all we can do as a management team is tell our story to as broad a range of groups of um, uh, potential shareholders as possible uh, and keep focusing on the business and the underlying health of that business. Thanks. Uh, and then the last one is, why haven't any of the non-execs on the board purchased any shares over the past two years? I'll hand that over to Sue. Thanks. Yeah. Um, what we have got is obviously four non-executive uh, directors, all of which have shares in the company. Uh, two of them joined in 2020 and were part of the placing uh, that happened in January 21. Uh, so all of them actually hold um, shares in the company. Thanks.
Thanks, Georgia. Thanks. Uh, so we'll now move on to questions asked during the call. Uh, the first one is, when does Faros expect to be debt free? I'll take that one as well. Um, thank you. Uh, so as, as you'll have noticed from the first half, we've managed to improve the net debt position down to 37.9. Um, so great position because of the first half performance. Obviously, those uh, high prices of Brent continue to throughout this uh, second half. So, you know, I should expect to see a a similar trajectory uh, as, as we move forward. So I can't give you the exact uh, date. Uh, what I can say also is obviously the RBL itself has a tenor of uh, 2025. So June 2025 is the position when that must be paid down. But, um, you know, obviously, as we sit here today, it's, you know, we're, we're going uh, further out uh, and getting closer to that net debt, bringing that down to towards the zero. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Egyptian uh, dollars payments, what is the outlook? Okay, I'll take that one as well. Um, obviously, it's one that we've highlighted in our results and is very important as we move forward. Um, what I would say is, as you know, we are working on a number of uh, opportunities there in terms of transferring Egyptian pounds into US dollars. Uh, we did actually, as a team, meet with the National Bank of Egypt uh, at uh, last week, and uh, I would say that it was a very positive meeting, and they do seem to be seeing a chink of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I understand that the IMF, uh, the you know, discussions with the IMF continue, and so uh, hopefully we should see an improvement in that position as we move forward. Uh, the next question is um, issue bonds versus RBL an option, given the punitive cost of hedges associated with the RBL. Okay, I don't know whether Jan, you wanted to, to pick that one up. Well, we looked at um, issuing a bond a few years ago. Um, uh, never say never. It was very expensive uh, at the time. Are the hedges punitive? Um, it's certainly a discussion point with the banks um, as we come to the next round of redeterminations, given that the balance sheet strengthened. Um, and as you saw from one of Sue's slides, the um, range of uh, hedge positions that we've got now is opening up far more attractive oil prices. So uh, last year, when we needed to get through uh, a working capital, uh, test stress test for um, a shareholder circular. Uh, we had to layer in far more hedges. That wasn't to do with the banks. That was to do with um, the merchant bank who were sponsoring the circular. Uh, but moving forward, you know, we're open to um, swapping out uh, to whatever debt instrument is the most most attra attractive. I mean, Sue talked earlier about the term of the RBL and um, the way that we've set the dividend policy and um, you know there's a minimum payout threshold but what we do with the cash after that one of the options is to um, repay the RBL more quickly and you know that's certainly something that we'll keep keep an eye on. Thanks Jan um, and I'm conscious of time so we'll be taking one last question now uh, before we move to summary. Uh, the last question is, any plans to introduce green energy elements in existing producing assets, particularly TGT with the FPSO? Okay. Do you yeah. want to... No, on you go. Okay. So we, uh, let's basically I give you an answer on the two assets because it's important. Jan talked about the emission management fund, which will be used to fund this long-term project with the technology that allows us to reduce the reduction in the two assets. The FPSO, uh, the design of it is basically, right now we looked at many different options of what can be implemented, and actually, in fact, the, the emission reduction. So what we're looking at is improving the efficiency, uh, like the gas compressors, the different kits. By improving the efficiency on the different kits, we improve the emission in the In Egypt, there are a couple of different projects that could uh, reduce the emission, one around uh, power from the grid, and uh, another one converting the diesel generator into a gas generator. So both of those uh, projects are, are, are progressing right now. We're looking at uh, different ways to implement 
but overall the reduction in emissions is in a way we think about it as two stages first the stage is what you can do right now which is improving efficiency and some of the projects that been identified economically viable it adds to the operations efficiency and reduce emission to so one and three different fronts and on the next stage is the technology that can be implemented whether we uh, basically once they're available we implement them in the field and that emission measurement fund will help us implement some of those uh, long long term technology mm -hmm. That's great. I, I might just jump in at that point and uh, thank you all for your engagement this afternoon and thank you to everybody for their questions. Any further questions do come through, we'll make those available to the company for their review post today's meeting. Um, Jan, if I may, I, I know investor feedback is particularly important to you and to the company and I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their thoughts and expectations. Uh, but Jan, perhaps before doing so, if I may, just ask you for a few closing comments and then I'll send investors for their feedback. Okay, well, at the risk of repeating myself, just three key messages. The cash generations engines are working, and we've seen, as Sue said, significant deleveraging in the first half of this year, down to 0 0.5 net debt to EBIT tax, which is a very comfortable level. That cash generation performance has given the confidence to resume cash returns to shareholders, first in the buyback, and secondly, with a minimum dividend commitment starting in 2023. And finally, that's the yield side of the equation. We offer significant growth in our assets. We've got a range of opportunities. Some of them are for near term cash flow, but there's also growth opportunities in both Egypt and in Vietnam. That's for us today. Thank you very much for your time. That's great. Jan, Sue, Mohammed, thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, please could I ask you not to close the session as we're now going to automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Faris Energy PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. I wish you all a very pleasant afternoon.